Hi, I'm Ted Bible, pastor at St. Mark's United Methodist Church, and thank you for joining me today as we uh, continue our sermon series on favorite uh, stories from the Old Testament. But before we get to that, I just want to once again invite you to share any prayer concerns, joys or concerns that you would like for us to, uh, to be in prayer with you over. And uh, send us prayer re requests by email to limastmarks at gmail.com limastmarks at gmail.com, and we would be happy to join you in prayer. Additionally, tomorrow evening, uh, we, are, we are having our free ice cream Sundays, And so from 5.30 to 7.30 out in our parking lot, uh, weather permitting, uh, we, will be, uh, we will be sharing uh, and enjoying fellowship and some music as well uh, with, with uh, ice cream. And so I invite you if you're in your neighborhood and the community to, to stop on over and to enjoy that. Well, everybody loves an underdog. And in this favorite Old Testament story of David and Goliath, the apparent underdog, that being David, has a resource at his disposal that everyone in this story has forgotten about. And that resource is God. Now for an overview of, of the story to bring us up to speed here, the green rolling hills surrounding the valley of Elah still stand today, and they witness one of the most remarkable battles recorded in the Bible. It began when the Philistines, who at that time were constant enemies of the people of Israel, assembled their army on one hillside, and on the opposite hillside uh, was the army of Israel. Every day, for 40 days, we're told, a giant named Goliath, a man who, ex who, was, who exceeded in height of nine feet, and who wore armor that was, you know, matched his size. Every day for 40 days, he would go out and he would taunt, and he would challenge the army of Israel, saying, choose a man for yourselves and let him come to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I win and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When King Saul and the Israelite army heard these words from Goliath, they were terrified, and they retreated back to their camp. Saul had a special reason to be afraid, because Goliath was the giant among the Philistines, and Saul, Scripture tells us, stood head and shoulders taller than any of the Israelite men. So it would appear that Saul was the logical choice to go out and to square off against Goliath. And we can expect that others might have assumed that he should fight Goliath as well. In our story, we are introduced to David, who was the youngest of the eight sons of Jesse. And we are also introduced to his three oldest brothers who served as soldiers in the Israelite army. So if you want to follow along, go to the Old Testament, first book of Samuel and chapter 17. And we'll be picking up at verse 17. Verses 17 through 50. So 1 Samuel chapter 17. And it reads, Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Israelites. Early in the morning, David left the flock with a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now here we have a young David being sent on an errand by his father to go and to check on the welfare of his brothers. He arrives just as the army is leaving camp, shouting as they go out to take up their battle positions. This has evidently been going on for 40 days, while each army waits, on the other, waits for the other to charge up the opposing hill to attack their enemy. 
The army that crosses the valley first and charges up the hill will likely suffer the greatest casualties. So this game, it appears, plays on every day. Goliath then also would, would make his way out to the middle ground and he would shout insults to the Israelites. And after a while, they would run away in fear and in shame. Reading on then from verse 25. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. The situation had become so desperate that Saul needed to offer a prize, to offer a bribe, to offer a reward to, to any man or who, who would go out and who would fight Goliath and win. He would offer him money, marriage to his daughter, which would place him then in the royal family, as well as a family tax exemption. All this to induce someone to go out and to go battle Goliath. Here we first discover in our reading that the men of Israel saw things only from man's perspective, while David saw things from God's perspective. The, the, the soldiers focused on the danger of the battle, while David focused only on the reputation of Israel and on the honor of God. This truly shows David to be a man after God's own heart. He cares about the things God cares about. David saw the problem in spiritual terms, not in physical or material terms. Reading on then from verse 28. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and he asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom do you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done? David said, can I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. We might have thought that David's visit would please his older brother. But instead, what David said made him angry. And perhaps it made him angry for the following reasons. First, he was angry because David was just a young kid and he didn't feel that David had any right to speak so boldly to other soldiers. Second, he was angry because he felt that he knew David's motivation, which he said was his pride and his wicked heart. But it's clear that his older brother did not know David's heart at all. Third, he was angry because he thought David was trying to provoke someone or to encourage someone to go out and go battle with Goliath just so he could see the battle taking place. And then finally, he was angry, and he probably was, wouldn't be willing to acknowledge this reason, but he was angry because David was right. When you are humiliated, when you are frustrated and greatly afraid, the last thing you want someone telling you is to be courageous. But David didn't back down. There's no doubt that what his brother said hurt, but he would not let it hinder him. David was more concerned with God's cause than with his own feelings. When David was misunderstood and publicly rebuked by his brother, probably amid the laughs of, this, the laughs of other soldiers, he could have quickly walked away. But David showed his strength and his determination, which came from his faith in God, because David didn't care about his own glory or his own success. He only cared about the glory and success of God. Reading on then from verse 31, what David said was overheard and was reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine, your servant, will go and fight him. 
It wasn't as if David's words were all that bold. He never said, I'm not afraid of that giant. I'll go out and fight Goliath and I'll kill him. David, David didn't talk like that. But what he said was worth reporting to Saul. No doubt Saul had been waiting for someone to step forward to fight Goliath. But to hear the offer come from a young boy almost seemed like a, well, it almost seemed like a cruel joke. The good news is that someone finally wants to fight Goliath. The bad news is that it is a young shepherd boy. Reading on then from verse 33, Saul replied, You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been fight, he's been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over his tunic and tried walking around because, it was, because he was not used to them. I cannot go out in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in, a, in the pouch of his shepherd bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. It wasn't as if David's words were all that bold to what he said to Saul, but they were. He was ready to go to battle. Saul thought that David, was what, what, however, was not qualified to go up against him, to go up and against an experienced fighter like Goliath. This shows that Saul looked at the battle purely from a natural, outward basis, while David looked at the battle from a spiritual basis. But Saul didn't know that God had prepared David for this battle when David was a shepherd. When a lion or bear attacked the flock, David fought the animal and he won. It appears that, Dave, that, that God had been preparing David for such a battle as this. This is generally the way God prepares his people for future battles. He calls us to be faithful right where we are, and then he uses our faithfulness to accomplish great things. If David ran away scared from the lion or the bear, he would, have been, he would not have been ready to go out and fight Goliath. But he was faithful then, so David will be faithful now. In the midst of our preparation, we rarely see how God will use it. Yet now, David can look back and, and see how God used him and how he delivered him when he faced the lion and the bear. David knew that, that God's help in times past would sustain him on this day because no matter the intensity of the battle that he faced, he knew God would be with him. And no matter the intensity of the battle that we faced, we too should know that God will be with us because he has promised never to abandon us. Saul figured that if this boy was going to beat Goliath, he needed the best army and armor in all of Israel. And the best armor belonged to the king, but it didn't work. It didn't work because Saul's armor didn't physically fit David and because it didn't spiritually fit David. Armor, military technology, or human wisdom would not win this battle because this battle belongs to God. Sometimes people try to fight with another person's armor. They see God do something wonderful through someone else, so they try to copy it without really making it their own. God's work is never most effectively done this way. So David took with him the same tools he used before as a shepherd, the same tools he used before to kill the lion and to kill the bear. He took a staff, a sling, and some stones. 
What God used before, God would use again as David stepped out to battle Goliath. Verse 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. And he said to David, and I, Am I a dog that you come with me at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel." All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell faceward on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and he killed him. Obviously, because of Goliath's size and experience, this did not appear to be a fair fight. There was nothing about David or about his God that struck fear into Goliath. In fact, Goliath was insulted that David stood before him. Imagine the scene with me, if you will. Goliath shouts with a deep, thundering voice that echoes against the hills of the valley. No doubt the sound struck fear into the heart of every Israelite soldier. And then David answered back with his teenage voice perhaps even with his voice cracking a bit. The Philistine soldiers probably laughed when they heard David speak, and the Israelites were no doubt embarrassed. When David says, you come with me with a, come at me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come, with you in the, come to you in the name of the Lord, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled, when he says this, he is making a contrast between himself and Goliath. In other words, he's saying, you have some pretty fancy weapons, and no doubt they have served you well in the past. But I've got something better than your weapons. I don't stand before you with God behind me, but I stand behind God who will defeat you today. Goliath is now enraged at David's boldness. And as as Goliath approaches, David doesn't run from the battle but rather David runs to the battle. With his sling in hand, David had the calm hand and careful aim of someone who really trusted God. He used the sling and he hurled the stone and he killed Goliath. So the takeaway from the message today comes to you in the way of a question. So where was God in this battle? Well, God was always there, and in fact, he had been there for 40 days, but King Saul didn't acknowledge him, nor did any Israelite soldier acknowledge him. Saul and the army were giant-focused, not God-focused. The acknowledgement and focus on God didn't appear until David showed up. Too often today, in the lives of so-called Christians, You know, those who are Christian in name only, those who show up periodically for worship, those who keep their Bibles in the drawer of their home or or those Bibles that are dusty sitting on the shelf, those who only call on the church when they have a need, those who only pray to God when their earthly giants are knocking at the door, or those who only call upon God or wish to follow Jesus when it is beneficial, when it is convenient, or when they are desperate. These 
so-called Christians are giant focused. Did I step on some toes today? If so, I'm not sorry. You say that this description doesn't pertain to me. I'm not like that. Well, good for you. But I challenge you to pray about that and to be honest with yourself and be honest about your relationship with God and with his son, Jesus Christ. Surrendering one's life to God will represent a sacrifice of my will to the acceptance of thy will. But when we accept thy will, then our battle against the giants are no longer our battles. But rather, these battles now belong to God. And that's exactly where they belong. Let us pray. Loving God, give us the courage, give us the desire, give us the determination to surrender once and for all our will to battle our giants. Let us surrender to you so that your will will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you once again uh, for joining me today, and thank you for your, prayer, your prayer support as well as your financial support of the ministries here at St. Mark's. And if you would like to uh, support us financially, you may do so by mailing your gift to St. Mark's United Methodist Church, 1110 North Metcalf Street, Lima, Ohio, 45801, or you may give online by going to limastmarks.com. Click on the, uh, the link in the upper right-hand corner that says Give, and that will take you to our giving page, and you'll find uh, a number of options there of ministries that you can support here within the church. Well, next week we continue with our favorite, old, uh, favorite stories from the Old Testament, and I hope you'll come back and join us then. In the meantime, God's blessing to you. Go in peace.